I want to take a few minutes and talk about the ways in which you can be successful either over the summer or the semester by really taking the time and the devotion to understand theology. Now I've been studying theology for uh, for over a decade now and, and I realized that that this term is is almost superfluous because I don't know if anyone can really understand the deepest questions that humanity has sought to answer. But I do think that there are some skills and some steps that we can all uh, adhere to and embody in order to really have a successful time together. So I want to start first. What is theology? Uh, this term is, is oftentimes misunderstood. In its most basic form, theology is, uh, in the Greek, thoughts uh, or logos about theos, um, thoughts and words about God. So in other words, if somebody thinks or speaks about God, they are being a theologian. Now, there are different types of theologians. There are some people that that use theological language uh, just in common day uh, vernacular, that they, you know, they stub their toe and they, they choose to say something. Or they might be uh, at a hospital or they might be in some situation and they, they might say, well, God does this or God did that. So those people are theologians too, uh, not just those of us that have gone uh, to school to, to get degrees and to have actually studied the academic discipline of theology. In a sense, anybody who thinks or speaks about God is, theolog is a theologian. And so there is a difference, however, between those people who have dedicated their minds and their hearts and their lives to studying it and people who use uh, theological language just kind of in their common day vernacular. What you are going to be doing this semester is you're going to be learning some of the academic tradition of uh, the study of theology. So number two, some people oftentimes refer to theology as the science of God. Um, it's the investigation of, of concepts, of narratives, of, of reason. And please uh, don't underestimate that term reason. Um, we're going to be talking about that throughout the semester. There are different types of theologies. We'll get into this later on. Christian theology is really speaking about God in a uniquely Christian way. So similarly, Islamic theology, Jewish theology, uh, Hindu theology, they are all speaking about God in a specific tradition. And we're going to use a great philosopher uh, here in, in, in a little bit to help us really understand that. What makes the theology so difficult? I, I think one of the main reasons is that uh, the early church oftentimes referred to theology as the queen of all the sciences. You have to have a basic knowledge of history because theology and history are so deeply intertwined. Uh, theology and politics oftentimes go hand in hand, not only how the ancient people thought of it, but even how people think of it today. And those are very, very different. Uh, if, you, uh, if you know much about the Hebrew Bible, they very much believe that theology and politics went hand in hand. Uh, the theology at the time of Jesus in the first century of the Common Era, they too thought that theology and politics went hand in hand. What I mean by that is, is what happened in the world was somehow divinely uh, planned or operated by God. And yet today, whenever there is a hurricane, we know why hurricanes happen. Whenever there's a tornado or an earthquake, we know why those things happen, and we don't attribute theological language to that. And yet, there is still an ongoing discussion and dialogue about what is the relationship about theology, or with theology and politics, especially in the Western world and especially in America. In order to understand theology, uh, I think you have to understand literature, and, and I'll say it uh, the opposite as well. I think in order to understand literature, you have to understand theology. There's so many biblical and religious allusions throughout the, the literary uh, canon that we have that it's almost impossible in my mind to really thoroughly understand re uh, theology without literature and also to understand literature without theology. I don't want to perpetuate the idea that science and religion are juxtaposed to each other or that they are in tension. We'll talk about this much later on, especially in the theology class, but you need to understand that that sometimes the, that these two disciplines can really go hand in hand. We're going to read a section of Pope John Paul II, who argues quite similarly here. The final two, theology, I think, is, is very much uh, embedded with, with the academic study of sociology, of human patterns, of, of how we create communities and how we create traditions, how we create certain types of, of uh, environments or, or traditions that we very much participate in. 
Is it that humans create religion? Or is it the religion somehow comes from above? And then finally, the study of, of humanity, the anthropology uh, aspect of theology is deeply, deeply interesting here. Shane Claiborne, the gentleman on this picture, he is a, uh, is a theologian today. He's, he's fascinating because he is a modern day monastic. He lives, I believe, in Pittsburgh with a small group of people. And what they do is they have, have basically uh, live in this community where they embody a lot of the convictions of the early church. They combine all their money together. They work in service of, of the poor. They advocate for social and political justice. And he is referencing a quote by the great 20th century theologian named Karl Barth. So Barth said, we have to read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Uh, Shane Claiborne adds, our faith should not cause us to escape from the world, but rather to engage it. I think he's right. Perhaps we make the error of, of thinking that theology is an escape religion, is something that we can escape from this world. But if you know anything about the New Testament or even the Hebrew Bible, God calls God's people to work in God's creation to bring about justice and peace. And so a few tips. Uh, theology deals with some of the deepest philosophical and theological questions that humanity has wrestled with from the earliest evolution of our species. These questions predate you and me, and they will postdate you and me profoundly. So theology has to do with questions. I think we often make the error of thinking that the religion and theology has to deal with answers. That we, can, that we can put these answers to these deep, deep questions in a really easy box that is really easy for us to understand. Now, I will make every effort that I can to make this, this topic uh, and these, these very deep questions relatable and easy to understand. However, theology is the pursuit of questions. And I don't know if we will ever be able to fully answer or fully comprehend a lot of these questions. I understand that I'm asking a lot here, but try to be comfortable with questions. And third, work with an open mind. Humanity is, is continuing to wrestle with these and will continue to wrestle with these questions uh, until, you know, until we've found a way to, uh, to, to end our, our own species as we know it. Traditions are developing. Uh, Christianity developed out of, out of Judaism. Uh, Islam developed out of Judaism and Christianity in, in certain respects. And so traditions are going to continue to develop and to adapt and to change, similar to Karl Barth's quote, because we read theology with one hand and the newspaper in another. And so another, uh, another suggestion is to question your own preconceptions. It seems to me that we are so convinced that we know something, that we are right, and yet we don't have all of the data. We don't have all of the experience in front of us. You know, for me personally, I don't know if I will ever think that I'm right about many things theologically. Now, I do have deep, deep convictions, absolutely. But these convictions are ongoing and they will be uh, perpetuated in my own intellectual and, and religious journey throughout my life. And so this quote, I think, is really pertinent. Allow yourself the uncomfortable luxury of changing your mind. I'm in my 30s, you're 16, 17, 18. The world is still in front of us in many respects, and we haven't read, we haven't learned, we haven't experienced so much of what the world has to offer. And so allow yourself the uncomfortable luxury of changing your mind. And so how do you read? Don't read to simply read. I know that's my second point, but I'm going to come back to that. Read uh, to understand. The purpose of reading is to really glean information, to understand what you're reading. And so if you read simply to say, hey, I read this, then I think that you're missing a, a major opportunity there. How often times have you gone to class and said, man, I read it, but I just didn't get it. I'm going to push you on this because I think now that that is, unac is unacceptable. You can't do that on the football field. You can't go to your coach and say, you know, hey, coach, I read the playbook, but I, I just didn't get it. You know, I can't do that at work. Um, that is why I am here. That is why I have videos. That is why uh, you and I can have a relationship into, into really investigating and understanding this. However, this also requires a responsibility on you. If you read to understand something, that's going to take a little time. So a few, a few tips. Read with a pencil. 
I've found that reading with a pencil is super helpful because I can take notes, I can circle things that are important, I can underline, I can annotate, I can summarize important themes, I can draw connections on the, on the page, and I think that that's really helpful. A few other points. Understand before you criticize. It seems to me that in so much of our society, we, un we criticize before we really understand. And so take the time uh, to devote yourself to understanding the work before you criticize. And if you don't understand it, work until you do. Watch the videos, read it again, ask questions, look up words in dictionaries. Try to find ways in which you can really understand this, this stuff. So here are a couple pointers. Circle important words or phrases. Underline phrases that you don't know or put a question mark if there's a question. Uh, if there's an answer, scholars often do this. They will, they will write or ask a question and then in the next page or two, they will work to answer that. So if you see a, a question, put a Q. If you, you see an answer to that question, put an A and draw a line there. Make, a, make it a point to really understand what you're working and what you're reading. On the wire, you'll see this document here. I think that it's super helpful, especially these first couple pages. Your goal is to understand the material. This is actually one of the virtues that we're working towards, is to really understand what we read, and then to be able to critically reflect upon it. And so take a look at this. Uh, it's, it's really quite helpful in really uh, uh, allowing you opportunities to just think about how to really understand this work. And so I'm going to leave you guys there. I want to let you have a little bit of time to reflect and to tell me how you will work to be a successful uh, learner over the summer or over the semester. You know, Martin Luther, I think, uh, to conclude, said it quite well. Again, Luther is the great uh, reformer uh, of the church. He said, in truth, you cannot read too much in Scripture. And you cannot, or in, in what you read, you cannot read too carefully. And what you read carefully, you cannot understand too well. And what you understand well, you cannot teach too well. And what you teach well, you cannot live too well. Because you are about to embark on what I have found in my life, a very challenging and profound journey of learning and understanding theology. Uh, I am with you along the way. I will encourage you. I will challenge you. Uh, but I'm also asking your uh, devotion to really trying to understand what we're going to be reading.